my first near-death experience happened when I was seven years old uh, in France, July 7, 1952. And I was in vacation at my grandparents' estate. It was a joyful place for me to be at. And that day, um, I was running in the meadow and looking for flowers. The idea behind it was to bring my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, a bouquet of uh, flowers. Uh, so I was running downhill, looking for all kinds of bachelor's button and even coquelicot. And um, one thing that I really wanted to get were bright heads with peace. And they were coming, emerging off a field of wheat. They were just glorious. I had to have them. And of course, the wheat was taller than I was. It was towering over me. So in order to do this, I had to run into this forest of wheat to grab the, the sweet peas. But I was determined to do it. I had a moment of hesitation and then I focused on it and said, well, just go. I was not looking down. I was looking at the flowers. And in the process of doing this, I disturbed uh, an asp. I stopped and I looked down and I saw the viper it was staring at me and the asp striked my left ankle and I felt that huge, enormous pain coming from my ankle. The viper just wandered away very fast. And I just know at this time that I was going to die. I was not scary. The pain was atrocious, so I turned around and I started to run uphill to the house. But in the meantime, I screamed as loud as I could. And I guess to give you an idea, the house was located on the top, on the top of a hill. And I was in the middle part of the meadow, which on the other side was the village. So the whole village heard my scream, and so was my grandmother. And she ran down um, to pick me up and by the of course, the more you run, the more the venom will go through your heart and into your body. And I just collapsed. So she, I told her, the only thing I could say was, a snake bit me. And she understood immediately. So she um, put a garret on my leg, upper part of my leg, and then she tried to cut open where the, the bite was in order to extract as much venom as possible. But it was already too long. and. I went into unconscious. So she, she picked me up and uh, took me to the house, put me down on the chaise lounge, and ran for my grandfather to get help. I got violently ill. I started to throw up nonstop and in and out of passing out and not really knowing what was uh, around me. I uh, had not a clear you know, memory. I flashing pictures of people coming and going. But before the doctor could get to me, two doctors actually. My mother was walking for one of them. It took two hours. So when they finally got to me, um, one of the doctors decided to give me uh, an injection of uh, anti-venom in my abdomen. The other one was saying it was too late anyway, but they did. And then I went into a coma for 10 days. I have no idea of time. I don't know how long after that it was. I just left my body, and uh, when I was leaving my body, I saw myself. I was not interested by it, by this body, by this thing. I didn't even realize at first that it was me. But my leg, this leg, was three times the regular size. It had turned brownish, greenish, yellowish color, basically the color of the snake. And, you know, I just kind of left that in a hurry. So I was in mid-hair, floating, and I was attracted by a strong, strong light above me. And I just let myself go to it. And when I reached that point where the light was, here was this magnificent, beautiful being of light. She was the most beautiful being I, as I have ever seen. All she was giving out was an enormous love compassion, understanding, um, this is it. This is what people want. This is what we all want. This is the place to be. The light was so powerful, but yet not blindly. It was not hurting my eyes or anything of the sort. It was, I was part of it. This beam of light just 
let me understood to come to her, so I did. There was no word spoken. She held me close and then had me stop right there. And she said that she had a message for me. The message, number one, was that I was not going to die. I was going to heal and live quite a long time, but I had a lot of things to do. And basically what I had to remember was that I was on this earth to help people. And with that came a long message. One of the things she said at first was, je suis ta petite maman du ciel, which means I am your little mother of the sky, literally, word by word. And I was seven years old since, to me, she appeared to be as Mary. I was in a Catholic school, so she was very familiar to me. She was something that I understood, that I know. The message was long, but all in metaphor, which took me a lot of years to realize and understand. Even now, I don't have all the answers. But many of the things that she has said happened, though, as my son's death. But the most, I think, powerful thing she said was, I always will be with you. When you're seven and you hear something like this, you think that every time you turn around, she's going to be there and appear to you. Well, that's not what she meant. But then days later, I came back to life. And then gangrene had started in my left ankle, where the bite was. And apparently, there was talk about amputation. And I told my grandmother, I'm not going to die. And you're not going to cut my leg. And she said, well, we hope not, you know, but it's a possibility. I said, no, come on, I'm not. I'm going to learn how to, how to walk again, you'll see. And then, of course, two months later, I was back on my feet, not walking normally. I had to have a cane, and it took a long time. But I was called a miracle child. And I didn't tell anyone except my grandmother what happened to me. My grandmother was kind of the healer of the village. She used to use her hands, but also herbs. And she had quite a bit of knowledge. I told her, and she said, she understood exactly what happened to me. And she said, don't ever talk to anyone about it. People will think you're crazy. So let's keep it quiet. And I did. Life became very difficult for me. I could not handle the sisters at school. It was a private boarding school that I grew up in, mostly. I love the sisters. Some of the sisters really were wonderful. But I also know what was true and not true. So I was very difficult to handle. And I felt like I was living in a fake world. I was looking everywhere for this little mother of the sky that never came back, and I thought she was. And I wanted so desperately to, go, to be back in her arms and be close to her. No, there is no question about the near -death a near-death experience being a dream, it's not. I remember the details, I remember the shoes that I wore that day, I remember the clothes I wore that day. I remember everything so clearly. And it's not a dream, it's something that, it's another dimension. I think it's the best way to try to explain this. I had dreams where vision and premonition came to me, things came to me, but it's not at all, not at all comparable to any of this experience. This is an event that will change your life forever. I wasn't the same. I was only seven, but I was not the same after this happened to me. Again, I could see things that I couldn't before. I could see through people. I understood without knowing the, the right and wrong. Um, I know the answers to so many things. And of course, as a child, who is going to listen to a seven-year-old or eight-year-old? You know, nobody, except stories, maybe. But um, that went on for 10 years. And again, I wanted to get so desperately in that light, in that magnificent space, that I decided that the only way to do this was to, um, to die. 
So I decided to swallow all the pills that I could find in the house, my grandparents' house, and swallow them, you know. So I waited until nobody was around and uh, swallow bottles and bottles of pills until I passed out. And the only thing, uh, the only reason I'm here today is because a, a, a friend from the village came to the house with her boyfriend to pick up a book that she landed me. So she got to my room, saw, found me, unconscious, passed out, and called her boyfriend, up, apparently. They dragged me off the bed, down the stairs, on my head, uh, by my feet. <laughs> I was full of bruises. Get to the hospital. I, I was out. I never woke up all this time. Get to the hospital, and then my heart stopped because it's been too long. So they tried to pump my stomach to get me back to life, and I left my body again. But this time was completely different than the first time. I again left it and saw my body on a gurney. Was not interested like the first time at all about that, and I was at, I was looking for a light. I was attracted to the light. And I floated back again to this spot where I couldn't see the light, but I was very strongly swallowed in that space, practically swallowed, and spit out. I found out later that it's the tunnel, but it's called a tunnel today. And it just dropped me on the other side where the light was, but it was a different light, a different dimension. It was not the same place I was in the first time. And uh, instead of seeing someone or a, new, if I, a beam of light, I only heard a voice, a very loud, very strong voice telling me, you can't stay, you have not even begun your work yet. And I was a very, a vo you don't discuss with that voice, you don't argue. I argue with everybody or everyone, but I could not think of arguing with that voice. All I could say, oh, no, you know, that's fair. So I had to get back in my body and back to life. I didn't want to. So that may be one of the reasons why I had so much problem doing it. But it was very painful to get back into this body. And I didn't want it, so I was kind of fighting myself. It took a while, and when finally I, I was kind of slipping into another, um, I could, it's not another skin, it's something different, something strange. We don't belong in this. When I got back, I, I finally opened my eyes, and there was a, a, a nurse sitting next to the gurney in tears. She thought I was dead, you know, so she was just, I was 17 and felt sorry and this and that. And I opened my eyes. <laughs> she stopped. She stood up from her chair and started to scream. <laughs> Run down, find a doctor. Bon, okay, I was back. So I had to go on. I had to accept myself. I had to accept why I was here and wait for, you know, whatever I was here to, to be doing. The, the things would come to me and unfold. The last near this experience uh, that happened to me was um, December uh, 1999. By then, I work with hospice or so helping people at the end of life um, and the families. Uh, so I, I was sitting, that was a nursing home, and I was sitting at the bedside of a lady who was herself in a coma that day. I was sitting in a green chair, and she were, I was facing herself on, laying on a bed. She was, uh, she was in a coma, so she was not responding. But I was just holding her hand, and I was sitting in a chair, relaxing and meditating. Suddenly, I felt, I let her go of her hand, and I, I felt this fever that hit me. I started to, to get soaked. I mean, literally having water dripping my, from my hair to my face, everything started to stick. And I know I had fever. So I just stood still for a while, and I couldn't get up. I kind of felt very bad. So I look at my, myself like this. I was in a golden light. And I did this because I wanted to make sure I was not dreaming. I was in the light. And I said, oh, here we go again. So I just let go. I just let go. And I found myself in another dimension again, never a place that I've been before. No beams of light. Instead, there was a voice again 
that asked me, do you want to come home? And at that same time, there was a flashing. It showed me the past, the present, and two future. But that was not me. It was not my life. It was the planet. It was the Earth. So, of course, I recognized the past, I recognized the present, and two future. We could have, have a much different and easier future on one side, and the other one was where we are now. I know I was going to suffer a loss, and um, it wouldn't be easy, but things were going to shift completely after this. Everything was gray. There was a lot of emptiness, not desert-like, but almost. People were not well-dressed, um, hungry, angry, both, and there was no balance. There was a war in the background, and the people who survived were in line, waiting to be fed and to be helped. Um, I was, again, part of this somehow. The sky was blood red, like I'd never seen a color like this before. When I traveled to the Middle East after my son's death in 2004, I recognized the sky to a point where I could not get up from my seat. I was so shook up. The same sky, the red color, the, the, the indescribable colors were there. And after we travel through Jordan to the Iraqi border and everything, everything is gray. There is a gray powder that sticks on everything, is everywhere. So I know where I was. I know where we were. And that's where all of this was shown to me very vividly. And it's like yesterday, I'm, I'm seeing it as I speak. I don't know how long that lasted. But when I finally came back to my body again, I was still in the same green chair. But it took me a while. And I had to wait for the person after me to come to relieve me from my shift. So I, couldn't, I didn't move, basically. And I was sick. I was very sick. And I passed out. The fever was 105.9. And when I arrived to emergency, I didn't understand why I was still here. You're dead at this. You just don't survive that. This time was harder. It was much harder to come back. I know that I was reaching to um, the topic, you know, the, the main core of the reason why I was here, and I know that loss that I was told a long time ago was really coming too. So the experience happened in 1999, 2004, Patrick was shot and killed in Iraq. After his death, that's where everything shifted. With Patrick, definitely. Oh, definitely. God. I'll go back to where I was when he died. That was in 29 Palm, the desert, Mojave Desert. I was there because a friend of mine was dying, and she called me and asked if I couldn't be with her, you know, to, um, before she goes. So, of course, and I drove. And from Tracy to 29 Palm, it's like eight hours drive, right? I got at her house, which was empty. She was in the hospital, but I got to her house to spend the night. Somebody gave me the wrong key. I couldn't get it the front door. So I walk around the, the house, and in the back of the house there is that storm fence that is 10, 15 foot tall. Okay, so what am I going to do? It's like midnight or 11 o'clock, and um, so I climb the fence. I mean, we're going, yeah? Climb the fence, I'm right on top of the fence, and it's dark, it's pitch dark there. I mean, it's the desert, there is no light around, it's just the sky. And when I'm sitting on top of that fence, here comes this green light in the sky, just beautiful green light. And I felt the pressure in my chest. Something happened. I know that. I say, okay, something, you know, somebody's either gone and healed, and I couldn't breathe. So I sat there for a little bit, closed my eyes, and I had to get down that fence, get in the house. And uh, there was a cat in there, the neighbor were feeding the cat, that was going completely out of his call. I know the cat. The cat loved me. I thought, we, you know, we know each other. Started meow. We started going crazy. I said, my goodness, what's wrong with you? Check the water, check the food, and try to hold. No, would hide under the bed. Wouldn't leave me alone. 
I tried to sleep, but I couldn't because of the light, because of the pressure I had in my chest. And the morning, I just got in my car and went to the hospital to see my friend and spend the day with her. I got there and we talked for a little bit and my cell phone rang. And um, my daughter-in-law was on the phone. I couldn't understand her. She was sobbing, crying. I couldn't understand her. And she tells me, Mom, uh, Patrick was killed. I say, okay, let me talk to somebody, sweetheart. So she did, and um, the military was there just to explain to me. And then what I did, I dropped my phone, and I dropped on the floor. I curled up like a fetus, and I just stood there, and I screamed, I guess. I don't remember exactly what I did. People just told me after. My friend was in tears, and I told her, Patrick, die. And she knew him, of course, so... All I know is that I had to get in that car and drive back to Tracy because my family was going to be lost. They wouldn't know what to do, I know that. Come to find out that the moment or the time, the exact time I was on that fence with the green light, Patrick says the moment Patrick was shot. The exact moment. Got to the house and there was a series of events that happened here, one after the other. But I think the most dramatic is the one with my granddaughter. She was two and a half, and she was playing, you know, like a, not really understanding. She understood that daddy was not coming back, but she didn't saw or understood the, to what level that was. And she's like me. She has a lot of things that she can heal herself and do things. Anyway, she was in the backyard, and she was playing with our dog. And she ran in the house and dragged me by my sleeve and said, come on, come on, come and see, come and see daddy, come and see daddy, daddy's here, daddy's here. So she dragged me out and um, there was a lemon tree and in front of the lemon tree, I saw uh, this exact place where Patrick was standing. I couldn't see him physically like I see you, but, but Janice, I did. She saw him and I, she described him, you know, daddy's here, he's happy. Um, and she said, come on, can we stay now? Can we stay? So um, what happened to me, I saw where his head was, where his shoulder were, and uh, where he was standing, and even movements. What it appeared like is in a very hot day, like in Santa Fe, or, you know, where the heat is really bad, you see these steaming spots, that's exactly where Patrick was standing. And he just wanted his daughter to know, and me, that he was all right. That's the first um, apparition that we had. The next day, or the day before that, we were sitting in the front of a computer, and that, that's where the first picture came from Iraq, from his unit, with the flower, the last one, the very last one. And the moment we were watching this picture, there was about 20 people around the computer at the time, we just became silent. There was not one sound in that room, nothing. There was something very, very strong. It's an energy, but it was also a scent, a scent of roses, to a point where people stopped. And I watched people's face, and they were all crying. Even Sylvia. Sylvia talks all the time, but she, she wasn't. She was frozen. And she tapped me on the shoulder and said, Mom, that's Patrick, he's here. We all know that. It's not something that you can explain and make a lot of sense out of, but it definitely was real. The light, the outside light, was turning itself on constantly to a point where the neighbor came and said, Nadia, you need to turn your light off because it's on for two days now. So I say, I thought I turned that off. So I went, turned it off, went to the store, and then back, the light was on again, all the time. Pictures of Patrick and Sylvia and both just would fell in front of us, face down. The television would turn on itself. Before he was deployed, he knew he was not coming back. He really um, thought that he was going to do something for, to help others, to help the soldiers, and he did. Because of him, we changed so many things in legislature. After General Nillman came to the House, they reopened 2,000 cases of deaths who were just pushed aside so the family could get a closure but also benefit or whatever needed to be uh, done with it. 
that's not it. I mean, there is a list, the ban over the coffin, uh, the freedom, because one of the first veterans that, uh, that I talked to national television were able to explain about PTSD, and I was one of the first crusaders for that. So there was so, so much of a spectrum around his death that he you know. And the night before he was deployed, he liked the, um, to do the cards with me, but not any card. It was the uh, American uh, animal cards. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Okay, so he, um, we did, and he just picked one card, and it was the raven. It's actually in here. And he picked the raven, and he started to laugh, and he said, Mom, look at my shoulder. His unit was the raven, the raven of war. So we laughed about that. We sat outside on the bench and watched all the raven and the crow coming because they were always around the house. And he said, Mom, I'll come and visit you with them. Every time you know, you're around, I'll, I'll be around with the crow and the ravens. The same night, my granddaughter uh, was two and a half at the time. She watched, you know, like kids do 10 times a day, uh, The Lion King. Okay, you know. I was there saying the earth thing at the time. And you know the story of you remember the story of the Lion King, he's being ambushed and killed, basically. And every time it was at the passage of the Lion King being killed, Janessa would grab her dad and not let go. Daddy, that's you. Daddy, that's you. To a point where um where I was fixing dinner with Sylvia and he ran into the kitchen where I was and he said, Mom. I'm not coming back, am I? I just said, you know, uh, she's a baby. She doesn't know, but you know. And after Patrick left, the next day, Yesu was watching The Lion King with her. I was. And she did the same exact thing every time. The same place. She grabbed my hand, said, come on, that's my daddy. You know, and... Um, before he left, he loved angels. You know, we had angels all over, and there are still, some of them are still here. And he loved the Archangel Michael, you know, because he was a defender of it, standing for right and wrong. And he said, well, I'll be working with him. Yes, I talked to uh, my little mother of the sky, I do. The one thing that she said to me was, uh, me parler et prier. And I never forget that. So it's kind of a way of prayer. And I do the, this system is through meditation. But yes, I, I totally do that. Uh, Patrick comes and goes whenever, you know, he, he may drop a glass or break a light or, uh, you know, trip me or pinch me sometimes. There is even physical uh, contact. But we don't have to use our voice. That was never a word exchange in any of my nearest experiences. Everything was felt. It's not just physical words. It's in depth. It's very powerful. One thing that I can say is uh, no matter how difficult life seems to be, we need to remember one thing, that if we are emerged in um, compassion, and love for others, we can make it through anything. It takes time to master, but we really can do it. And, um, and it makes you powerful because nobody can take you down. Definitely, it changed both. It changed life, the way, the way to live. The first 10 years were kind of a trial time where um, like a rehabilitation to life, which I didn't do very well, I guess. But after this, the, from this time until now, and the last experience was acceptance. But I am never afraid of death or dying. I am not afraid of anything. Well, there might be a couple of things like snakes, but uh, I'm talking about really I wouldn't run away for anything, you know, it's just, uh, it's part of this dimension. And I don't see death as the end. There is no end. That's why after Patrick, my son was born, I started to sit and volunteer in um, 
nursing home, but also other people who were dying in the street, the same street I live in and Patrick grew up, people would come and get me. Uh, we all had children, so we would pretty much know each other. And if a parent was on the edge of death, they would ask me to come and help them. So I did, and I know what to do. I just know. I would kind of walk the family through it. And I thought, well, this is right. You know, why don't I just do it uh, on a larger scale? And that's where I started a nonprofit, angelstaff.org, and uh, started to train people, give seminar and workshop on living and dying. And I work with the concept of um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Dr. Kubler-Ross. So um, that became the passion of my life. And I really thought for a long time until Patrick died that this was my mission, to help people transition from, one li uh, from this life to, um, to the next. And, you know, explain that we are born, we come from a place, we are born here, we die and we go back to where we are from. It's a circle. There is no death. And one thing that has become extremely clear to me is compassion and love. And I'm talking about unconditional love. If you can master these two elements in your life, no matter what, even people that you think you can hate, if you work over that and see the situation with compassion, you will see things on the inside, on the soul. This is kind of a mastery of life in a sense that I wish I could share everything I have learned with people so you know they would understand really why we all have a mission, I believe that. We have a purpose, we all do. And it's up to us to find that mission and purpose or not. We don't have to if we don't want to. Now it just depends after you have any of this experience, for example, on people's after effect and how they are going to embrace this. Some people cannot take the truth, cannot take facing what really happened to them and turn away from it. And you know, their life has become very miserable, of course. And that's why we have support group to try to understand each other. One who, person who has successfully overcome a near-death experience can help another who has more difficulties reacting or coming back from this experience to life. It's a trauma. After the experience has happened, the person who has the experience, survived the experience, return negative or positive. It doesn't make any difference. The thing is to accept it. And of course, if you accept the experience, and talk about it, it's considered to be a therapy and the therapy will automatically help you and accept who you have become. I believe it's a choice. This is a school, this is something where we're supposed to learn and everything is a struggle because we make it that way. I have struggles, I struggle, yeah, plenty, but I have an exit strategy if you like. I mean, I know where I'm going and if things get bad, you have to see that particular moment and make sense out of it, you know, instead of fighting it. Sometimes things are inevitable and you just need to live through it. I accept people for who they are. I don't try to change their mind. I don't try to project my ideas. I just can share what I know. Uh, people do what they want after that. It's not my mission to convince anyone or to try to tell them that there is life after death, you know, it's not. My, I know it is, and I know where I'm going, and so on and so on. But the rest of us, you know, it's um, we just have to discover ourselves. Like I first mentioned, um, my first near death experience was, of course, 1952. So okay, nobody talked about it, you know, except woo woos. Um, but. It took me until 1995 to realize, number one, that I was not the only one and uh, that there was nothing wrong with me, that many, many, actually millions of people are like me, through a book from Daniel Brinkley, um, Saved by the Light, where he was explaining his um, you know, this experience. 
and Dr. Raymond Moody was part of that, um, that everybody knows. Um, I read the book, I couldn't put it down. I stood at the store, I think I sat on the floor and I read the book through, bought the book and then went home, read it again. And I say, okay, I need to meet Daniel. Okay, I'm so well. At the time he was top, you know, so you had thousands of people who used to come to see him. And he came to San Jose, which was not too far from where I was. And there was like 2,000 people in that room. It was huge. And I say, okay, I need to get in front of the stage. You know, I need to talk to him, so I need to get in front. And I did. I just walked my way through it. I sat right in front of the stage, but I couldn't talk to him. So what I did, I just closed my eyes and I communicated with him through my mind. Oh boy, did that work. He stopped. <laughs> just stopped and he didn't say anything he just stared at me and walk again but he was looking two or three times he did that and then when he was over he just um, kind of dragged me along and he said we need to talk I was talking to him the whole time you know he didn't listen a word I said he was reading me he turned around he excused himself for a second he uh, hugged me and he said to me we're going to work together Sure enough, after I started working with hospice, Daniel was working with veteran and hospice. He started, actually, I'm involved with, in the beginning of the organization. We created, uh, my chapter created the first chapter for him, Compassion in Action. So I did work with Daniel. And we're, we're still good friends. You know, he just was here when I needed him for my son, Stas and everything. But it's just to show you that there are things that we can do. We don't know exactly what gift we have. We can't undo what has been done, but to make a shift in consciousness, it's like a net around the earth. And if this net has all reach, have a complete reach around the planet, we can raise the consciousness to a different level. But can we? Do we have enough power to be able to do this? I don't know. I don't know. I only can, I'm the seed. I, that's all I can do. I plant that seed. People do what they want after for the harvest. You know, it's not up to me anymore. I, I am at peace. I know what I am about. I pretty much know what's going to be accomplished in this lifetime. So, and I can see now, much clearer than I did before, um, what the beam of light, you know, was telling me in my first near-death experience. It makes a lot of sense. One of the most important thing in all of this is to never think that we are better than the next person to us. We are not. We are different, but we are not better. And because an experience happened to us doesn't mean that we know everything. We may have given the opportunity to do that, to touch the Agassiz record or whatever, but it's not, why do we forget? There is a reason for that too. And why I talk so much about love and compassion? Because precisely, there is so much misunderstanding among us today on this planet that we are destroying it. You know, not just each other, but we are destroying the planet because we don't love and respect the planet the way we should. It's all about consciousness. When we do this, where we are able to feel first and share next, we are elevating the consciousness. So by talking about it, again, not convincing, that's not my purpose, but people who, who um, find some truths or can reflect on some of the things that I say will bring another person to work with consciousness on the planet.